Hello, I'm Joanne Gallagher, your Think Future podcast host. This week, we're talking with two entrepreneurs, Marcus Ostermeyer and his project partner, Joel Vogel, on the topic of hydrogen solutions. They both share an aspiration to become market leaders as hydrogen producers and a supplier of choice on a local level. They joined the program to tell us about their unique innovation and approach to the energy market. This podcast is brought to you by Arcons, a global leader pioneering solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support digital transformation for the built environment and smart manufacturing. Visit Arcons.net to learn more about how Arcons are helping organizations design, build and solve through digitalization. From Arcons to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Archon's Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews, and profiles. Joel Vogel is the Managing Director and Co-Founder of Infinair, an innovative hydrogen solution company based in Munich. He has an education in business administration and geoscience, and has spent over seven years working with the world's largest building materials manufacturers. Marcus Ostermeyer holds a degree in mechanical engineering from the Technical University of Munich and completed a PhD there too. And over the past seven years, his focus has been on diesel engine power plants. Recently, he's been driving innovation in the clean energy sector through his own startup, OHS, or Ostermeyer Hydrogen Solutions, with a primary focus on hydrogen solutions on a local level. Both Joel and Marcus have joined forces with a unique approach and are eager to share. Welcome to the program, Joel and Marcus. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Marcus, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the technology of hydrogen? Yeah, maybe I should start in my childhood. I grew up in the countryside And uh, because my father was born in 1938, it was very important to him to be somehow self-sufficient, at least regarding food. So we grew our own vegetables, we had our own sheep, and self-sufficiency somehow was in our DNA, so to be really a little bit independent of everything else. And then I started uh, studying mechanical engineering, and then I joined a company who is doing electricity or power production, And so I came nearer to the topic of uh, hydrogen. And so hydrogen was the missing gap to this self-sufficiency. So if you want to be energy self-sufficient, so not only on food, but only on energy, then hydrogen is the missing gap, so to say. So if you hydrogen, you really can become energy sufficient the whole year round. And uh, so I dropped in this hydrogen topic step by step. And I really believe in a system where everybody is not isolated, but everybody can be self-sufficient on energy and is still connected to each other. So you can trade energy like you could trade food or anything else, and you are self-sufficient and you are somehow a community where you can share energy. So that's somehow the vision and hydrogen is the enabler to do this. Does that mean that you're filling this missing link or gap when, you know, like going off grid, say when, when the main power sources are down? Is that what you mean, that you have a backup solution? Yeah, that would be an option that you really say, okay, grid is down, but I still have energy. This, that's the one um, point that is important. And the other one is that with renewables like photovoltaics, everybody can um, generate electricity, but not at all the time. Because, I mean, you only get electricity when the sun is shining. And especially in Germany, we have winter, summer and winter. So you can produce more energy in summertime, but you also need energy in wintertime. So the question is, how can you store it? So like my grandmother used to, to take fruits in the summer and conserve it for the winter. And this is the same principle. You take energy in the summer and conserve it in the winter. And what you need is hydrogen. And that's the reason why we start this hydrogen business. So you're, Marcus, touching into those advantages and disadvantages of using hydrogen. And, and it looks like, you know, it was very clear for you what the advantage and disadvantages is for Germany or for a Northern Hemisphere residents, let's say. 
Would it be the opposite for Australia or can you see a similar advantage and disadvantage for the Southern Hemisphere, a big country like Australia with very a lot of rural area and large distances? Can you go into that? I think it is a good option for all countries or regions where you really have a, um, so to say, energy gap because you have a week or two weeks where you don't have sunshine, where you have bad weather. And there is a startup in Australia which is doing similar things. It's called Lavo. They also store energy based on hydrogen only for a shorter time period because I never have been to Australia, but I think you also have some bad weather periods. <laughs> so they store uh, energy for two to three days. And we are really into storing hydrogen for three months. So to store energy for a much longer time. That's very interesting. And you'll probably tell us later how that's stored and so on and, and uh, how it can be very localized for people. But before we go into that, would you please just walk us through the general process of producing hydrogen? Yes, sure. The thing is, to produce hydrogen, it's quite easy because you just need electricity and water. And what you then do, you purify the water that you have a very pure water because you need this for the electrolyzer, the so-called electrolyzer stack. And then you take the electricity and as you maybe know it from school times back in, in chemistry or physics, they show you they put in two electrodes in, in water and then you can produce hydrogen and oxygen. And it's more or less the same. So we need water and electricity and you get hydrogen and oxygen. You get the hydrogen at uh, pressurized at 35 bars, the oxygen you get at uh, atmospheric pressure. And then you just take the hydrogen, store it in bottles. And if you want to store more, you compress it higher to 300 bars. And then you can reuse it in a fuel cell. So you take the hydrogen and the oxygen out of the air. And then you just make water and electricity out of it again. So the process in itself is very simple. So in terms of being practical, like a village, say, or a house in a town, in a rural setting... How does that work? Do, do you need a lot of water and a lot of electricity for the whole village? Let's say 200 homes. How would that work? How much water, how much electricity to produce enough hydrogen? I have to guess a little bit because it depends how much energy you need during winter time. I have an example of an office building. The office building has 35 workplaces and they have to store energy for three months and they need around about 200, 200 kilograms of hydrogen. And a 200 kilogram of hydrogen will need 2,000 liters of water to produce it, but you get it back again. And the energy content is about 6,000 kilowatt hours, which would be similar to 600 liters of diesel, so that you maybe have some, some reference. So and if I now would say I have a village with 200 people, I would say I, I take this about yeah roughly 10 times. So you maybe would need 20,000 liters of water and then uh, you have the, the energy content, like 60,000 um, kilowatt hours. So it seems pretty doable in terms of what you need. It is quite doable. I mean, the, there's a little advantage with hydrogen, especially in the countryside. You, you have space, so it's not a problem to put your storage there. It's quite doable. And I mean, there are some other companies also doing this. So it's, it's growing and the technology is developing. So I think this really will be an important building block for our future energy system. Joel, tell us about you and what inspired your partnership with Marcus and how did it all come around? I actually see some parallel backgrounds, especially in the past, because I was also growing up in the countryside, mostly around the Lake of Constance, but I was living in different places all over the world. And um, I remember we once had a building and we were one of the first ones using photovoltaic on the rooftop. Yeah, this was already in the late 80s. I wasn't even born at that time. But I remember that especially my father, he was pushing that topic like to the absolute max. Of course, at that time, he didn't use hydrogen to reach a certain level of self-sufficiency. But we had these old batteries in the house. And so we were using, of course, um, the electrical batteries to have electrical power over the night, etc. So this building had no grid connection. It was like a holiday home. and We had no grid connection, just photovoltaic and a very, very small windmill on the, on the top of the roof. So this is, of course, I was inspired by that. 
in my childhood already. And of course, we were living also very, very organic. We were also growing our food, only Demeter quality, etc. So we were a little bit in this scene around the Lake of Constance where, yeah, it's kind of super organic, everything what you eat. <laughs> this made me a very healthy person, actually. <laughs> I'm never, ever sick. The, the connection to Markus Ostermeyer came up um, through a company in Switzerland, WP Engineering. We do building service technology. We are always looking at innovations. And uh, yeah, some projects came up where we needed the product Markus is producing. And uh, that's how we came together. We were looking at different projects already. And uh, we are currently developing a product which is called the eCore. We will probably talk about this later. And um, the eCore has the capacity of the electrolyzer that we are targeting for our customer groups. So that's that's how we came together and how we were developing also some projects to a certain stage in the past two years. That's interesting. And how is the uh, technology developing and how has it been received in the market? We are currently um, producing the first prototype of the eCore which will be delivered around June this year. So this will be the eCore in its uh, design, how we see the eCore and how we want to introduce it to the market. We are already uh, working with customers who want to buy an eCore, but if there is no eCore physically there, of course, it's a bit difficult to convince them to buy the product. But this will change this year. We are currently working also on a, a marketing campaign that we are yeah, we are going to launch this year at the InterSolar. Uh, so this is going to be a huge event and we will show the eco physically there. This will be a great show. And uh, we also want to bring the customers to the InterSolar to see the eco and then, of course, to generate leads and uh, orders for the product. So the launch is in Europe somewhere? Where Where is that happening? It's in Munich. It's in Munich at the InterSolar in June this year. So let's say about what sort of uh, early adopters are there. Can you explain what who they are, what type of person they are, what kind of customer? I mean, mostly these are people who are like also inspired by the idea of being self-sufficient. But of course, you can also be interested into the eCore and of course also Marcus's uh, main product. If you have like high energy costs and if you want to gain more independency from the market fluctuations, uh, of course, some people also like the feeling of being, as Marcus described also in the beginning, being independent, uh, just being independent, have control of your own uh, power. And this is something where we are closing that gap. And with that eCore, of course, we deliver a full system that is, of course, not only storing energy, but we can also uh, supply the building with heat, uh, warm water, if it's needed, of course, also cooling. And of course, it's a storage for electricity uh, for all around the year. And this, of course, gives you also new opportunities in terms of architecture. So if you have your energy center in an external way connected to your house, you can use your space inside the building in a different way. And this is not only for existing buildings, but also new buildings. This, the, the, the major question is only if you have enough of space to put uh, solar panels on your rooftop or on your garage or wherever you have enough space. So um, actually, many kind of buildings could become energy independent. And the early adopters, of course, these are the people who are also looking at uh, design, uh, who are interested, probably like the first ones who were buying a Tesla. Also, these people were very much attracted by the design and, and the idea behind the product. And with eco, it's a bit of the similar group, mostly people from, I would say, higher income classes, of course, but who have uh, an openness for the topic of the energy transition per se and also push this in their life proactively. And so when you think about the built environment and cities and so on, do you have goals to you know scale this up so that they could be used in precincts where you divide a city up into smaller communities, say? Absolutely. I mean, the product now is just existing in one size, but of course it can be having a larger capacity to supply more buildings, supply quarters, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is, of course, to have a scalable a product um, with different financial models underneath. And what about manufacturing on site? Is that an application where people want to manufacture with electricity or power on site, say in remote areas where they're doing mining or? Absolutely, yeah, of course. 
especially in Australia, I mean, the whole mining industry needs uh, solutions like that, not only for power backup, also in the future, probably H2 units where they can produce their hydrogen for the heavy duty vehicles. Uh, it's not only about electricity, it's also about decarbonization of the fleets of these huge quarry manufacturers. So this is something which is super interesting for Australia. We also received already lots of requests actually from Australia. And as I heard now that there's even a first hydrogen powered home in Australia in the outskirts of Melbourne, of course, there the hydrogen is delivered and then connected to the building. It's not produced on site. But this, of course, also shows that Australia is going new ways. And I mean, Australia has the perfect conditions uh, to produce so much of uh, solar power and uh, produce also hydrogen, especially close to the to the coast of Australia, where seawater can be also desalinated, which is also an upcoming trend all across Australia. Well, this is so exciting. And do you have any other case studies from other parts of the world at the moment to share? Yeah, we are currently looking also at some islands, um, of course, Greek islands. We had already lots of projects coming up. Uh, I mean, as the topic of um, using hydrogen in buildings is a bit new, uh, of course, also the barriers to getting through is uh, they are not, not so easy to overcome. But especially islands, Azores, Madeira, Mykonos even, we are currently working with one of our partners on the project. And of course, always we are promoting the idea whenever it makes sense to integrate uh, a decentralized energy system based also on hydrogen. Uh, not, not, not always it's making sense, but in many, many cases, we are trying to give this a huge attention. Of course, you're opening doors with, with that topic worldwide. And there are some, you know, mindsets around hydrogen and barriers. I don't know how many of them are real and how many of them are perceived. But, uh, would you like to discuss that, Joel, or would you like to hand that over to Marcus? I see quite a quite a hard lobby and also lots of misunderstandings uh, when it comes to hydrogen. It doesn't matter if it's about safety, it's about the way how to store it. Many people think, oh, hydrogen can easily explode. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so lots of lots of uh, misunderstandings also the question of efficiency is always coming up and when i'm looking for example at linkedin and some discussions there of course a lot of uh, i would say aggressive powers coming from the battery electric industry although they necessarily belong together huh? hydrogen and, and and batteries <laughs> they belong together so there is no real competition but uh, on the surface, it looks like that there is a party promoting battery electric, for example, mobility and, and another another field of that is uh, promoting um, hydrogen or fuel cell mobility. And this is something which is, of course, course also politically used. So there's, uh, I would say, a lot of people in the public that are pushing into one direction At the end of the day you should be open to lots of technologies we all need these technologies and there's no better technology but but for the different use cases there's a, a better solution when you probably use hydrogen but this really you have to differentiate a lot from from case to case so it sounds like they are actually complementary depends on where and when and you know they can be working together very easily yeah i mean also for hydrogen systems, you also have a battery in place. It always acts as a buffer. So uh, you, of course, do not have large batteries because the storage density is lower than, than with hydrogen, as Marcus also described already. So if you want to store large amounts of electrical energy over a long time, of course, you, you look at hydrogen. And uh, a positive effect of hydrogen is you reconvert it to electricity. You also have heat, and that heat can be also integrated. So you have to look at the multidimensional way. Yeah. Look, look at energy in the right way to, to build a correct balance sheet of energy, to say so. This is important here. So speaking of balance sheets, that always brings up the cost. And how does that compare then to traditional other energy sources? This, of course, always depends on which market you're living and, of course, what the cost of energy is. I'm currently sitting in Switzerland. In Switzerland, we have a lot of hydropower. Taxation on electrical energy is way, way lower compared to many other countries. So, of course, if you have a hydrogen system here, it could be a bit more expensive. But looking at different markets, we are already in a parity. So what uh, you pay on the market is the same what you have when you yeah, have your own system running based on hydrogen. And as energy prices are going to rise, at least uh, based on, on fossil fuels, 
uh, what we will see over the next years, of course, the system will become uh, competitive. We'll be back to the conversation in just a minute. In the meantime, here's a little more about our cons. Arcons has a mission to advance the efficiency, quality and profitability of project outcomes for its customers by providing best-in-class technology and services. Are you looking for a digitalization and sustainability-focused partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to Arcons to start their journey toward a better built environment and smarter manufacturing. With more than 50 locations around the world, our cons can connect you to the right technologies and expertise so you can improve your competitive position and increase profitability. Our cons has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and sustainability journey. Visit ourcons.net to find out more. Marcus, how is the hydrogen stored and distributed, say, in a country like Australia or Africa compared to Germany? I would say there's not so much of a difference. I mean, there are certain possibilities how to store and transport hydrogen. So the first one is you pressurize it, and then you have a pressurized gas that's used in all over the world. So you put it in bottles, in high-pressure bottles, and transport it. Then there's another option. You could store it in metal hydrides. That's metal powder, but that's mostly used for stationary um, usage because it's quite heavy. And uh, I mentioned this uh, startup in Australia, Labo, they use metal hydrates as a storage option. And then you could use uh, something called LOHC. It's called liquid hydrogen organic carrier. So you really can bound the hydrogen chemical to a liquid, and then it's much easier to transport it. So I would say for Africa and Australia, this maybe is the better option because you can transport more hydrogen over longer distances. And then for sure, if you have hydrogen and CO2, you can do all the chemical derivatives you want to have, like methanol, methane, then, there is, uh, then also ammonia if you have uh, nitrogen, or there's something called DME, dimethyl ether. And uh, so you just use a chemical carrier substance or to say you produce from hydrogen something which is easier to carry. And for example, there's one project where they produce hydrogen in uh, South America, uh, really in the South, and they are producing methanol, and then they are, they are transporting it to Germany via ships, and then they are using the methanol. So uh, there are several options, and it depends on the distance. The shorter you want to transport it, the, uh, then you take pressurized hydrogen. If you want to transport it uh, over a long distance, then you would take something else like LOHC or you would make methanol. Does that mean you could use pipes for the liquid like you do with water to transport it long distances? That's one option because this LOHC is similar to oil, so you really could transport it in pipes. But if you have pipes, you also can could transport it as a gas because, I mean, in many countries you have a natural gas grid. And in Europe, they are discussing to convert at least part of the natural gas grid to a hydrogen grid. And then you just transport it over the gas grid. Uh, what I don't know is how good the gas grid in Australia and Africa is. I assume it's not all over the continent. So if you have a gas grid, you can could transport it easily in a gas grid. If you don't have, you have to, to look for other means to transport it. Do you see any other challenges with adopting the technology? I think the, the biggest challenge really is because you need more space. So you really have to see how to compress or how to get hydrogen more compact to transport it. Everything else, I would say, is more or less common technology because back in the 40s and 50s, um, there was something called, it's, in German it was called Stadtgas, so city gas, and it was a mixture with a lot of hydrogen in it and CO, so carbon oxide. So hydrogen is, especially in the industry, it's a very common thing to work with. So I think it's more perception because the people are not used to it and they are more used maybe to, ele uh, to electric uh, things because you plug in all your devices every day. I mean, we are cooking with gas in our house, 
in, in Munich, so we are used to gas also. So it really depends what people are used to and if they have some perception how to use it and, and what they have to do, how to deal with it. So when it comes to applications in the built environment, let's say engineers, construction sites, manufacturing plants, is hydrogen used there already or is it applicable to use in industry? Hydrogen can be used uh, wherever you're using methane at the moment or um, other energy carriers like oil or coal or whatsoever. Because for a lot of chemical processes, you are taking fossil fuels and you are producing hydrogen to use the hydrogen. So that is be done already now. Then you just use green hydrogen instead of gray hydrogen. And uh, a lot of processes can easily be switched to hydrogen because if you use methane, then you just switch it to hydrogen. Okay, and you'll get the heat that you need, say, for a manufacturing process from the hydrogen, just as good as methane. It depends what you what you need it for. I mean, one thing is electrification, which will be a big trend. So you try to electrify processes as much as possible because electricity will be the energy source. You will have a lot more because you have PV and wind and so. So electrification always is the first step. And then you try to use hydrogen, for example, for heating or really for chemical processes. So you really need the molecule because you want to make something out of the molecule. And a lot of hydrogen is used in these processes, like, for example, ammonia production, which is fertilizer. There you need a lot of hydrogen. So you take hydrogen and nitrogen and make ammonia out of it. And there it's easy to just use green hydrogen instead of fossil-based hydrogen. So then circularity of water at these sites, whether they're manufacturing sites or industry sites, is very important, I would imagine, to work well with the technology. Can you say something about the design around circularity of water? I have to admit, in Germany, water is so cheap <laughs> that we don't do it at the moment. I mean, you get the water back as water vapor, so you get it back anyhow. It's like a tree who is uh, evaporating water in the air. But what we really do, because we have a project in Africa and there we are really looking in getting the water from the fuel cell back and really get it back to the electrolyzer so that we have a, a water, a closed water cycle because that's worthwhile because water is yeah, has a higher price. And so in countries like in, in Germany, it's not economical to do this. So it's you take the water, you get the water back as vapor, like from a tree. But for Africa, we are really looking into this uh, circular thing. So that's going to be a future case study, hopefully? or Yeah, it will be. It will be a feature we can offer in the future. So back to you, Joel. What other spinoffs are you excited about to share? At the moment, lots of companies are popping up. And of course, innovations are coming to the market. Uh, of course, what we always look at to see and utilize the whole value chain of hydrogen. And of course, heat is a part of that. Oxygen is a part of that. And uh, as Markus also said, closing a water circuit uh, can be very helpful to create also acceptance. Although, as he also said in Germany, this is not a big topic as water is cheap. But of course, uh, looking at some projects we are currently starting, there as well always the question of water usage comes up and there's one company in the Black Forest that is offering solutions also to use rainwater. Uh, so we are collecting rainwater and in some region it makes sense huh, to collect the rainwater and use it for hydrogen production. So there's a solution uh, based on that. Then, then we are also currently discussing a solution uh, with a company that is offering phase change materials. So uh, like mobile storages for heat. So it's a solution that can be connected uh, to the heat output of the electrolyzer and then integrated where it's needed. For example, in swimming pools. In the city of Berlin, there is already a concept which is also economically feasible. Uh, these PCM storage systems are circling around heavy industries where they have a lot of heat output. The perfect uh, temperature is around uh, 58 to 65 degrees, depending on the composition of the material. And then they connect it to swimming pools all over the city. And this is something which is really cool. As um, you do not release your heat, it's just waste for you. You can uh, use it and integrate it where it's needed. And uh, in Europe, we have lots of countries where heat is becoming pretty expensive. For example, in the UK, 
Uh, lots of old people are really suffering and they cannot pay their bills anymore. Heat is uh, something that is uh, quite valuable in winter times. And uh, yeah, all these concepts we are looking at, all these innovations we want to utilize. We are, I think, now in a, in a phase where the technology is, is developed. It's just about to further develop it, to make it more efficient and to yeah, utilize everything that is possible in the whole hydrogen production value chain. As well as uh, the usage of oxygen, uh, of course, um, there are different opinions on the market. If we can make use of the oxygen that is emitted during the production process of hydrogen, one kilogram of hydrogen makes uh, eight kilogram of oxygen. So actually quite a lot. And it's at the moment a side product. And there is no real, I would say, use case on the market for what we could use that oxygen. But as well, there's a lot of research ongoing in some companies that want to do that. And we are one of these companies that want to use the oxygen uh, from the hydrogen production in an industrial uh, way as, as the first company. So in the end, we want to monetize the green hydrogen, the oxygen, and of course the heat. And for that, um, there are innovations and, and solutions. And the question is very often if there are economically feasible. But for the heat, there is a solution that is already economically. Sure is, especially in those cold countries like Sweden. I used to live there and, you know, they burn their rubbish and heat the whole municipality with the heat through the pipes and up through the buildings. I mean, if you burn, well, I mean, the waste to energy, there are these plants, waste to energy, of course, uh, can also make sense in many cases to use the heat. Uh, for example, in the city of Zurich, there's a waste to energy plant uh, where almost uh, 180 houses are supplied with the heat output of that uh, burning process. And nothing is emitted to the air, so it's all cleaned. It's, it's just a way of removing the rubbish. It's a, it's a recycling process. So, Marcus, what are other good examples of solutions using oxygen as a side stream? If you get smaller, it's really getting easier because then you can use the oxygen locally. And we, for example, are talking to a hospital um, who wants to produce hydrogen and then also could use the oxygen quite easily because, I mean, it's nearby. You just uh, take a pipe <laughs> and connect it to the hospital. And there's one project where they really make all the analytics of the oxygen to find out if it usable and it looks very good then we are looking into breeding fish because they need uh, some fish need a lot of oxygen not all of them but some and then it's also quite easy because you also produce hydrogen and oxygen on site and you also can use the heat because some fish also need a little bit warmer water and the third thing is sewage plants where you also need oxygen and you take it at the moment from the air pressurize the air and use this there you also could uh, use oxygen quite easily. So and these are the three use cases where it will be the easiest uh, to use oxygen. And if you do it on site, you don't have to transport it, then it makes it a lot easier. So there are some use cases where you really could use the oxygen. Seems like endless innovation happening here <laughs> <laughs> in Germany anyway. So one final question to you both, Joel and Marcus. When you think future about all the opportunities that lie ahead for this hydrogen technology, so what excites you the most? As I said, my vision really is to have local energy communities. So hydrogen for me is the missing link to really build a system with local communities which can control their energy and also have all the as they produce the energy locally, they also get the money locally. So they really can have to say more value on site or more value where they live. They, they, they can generate the value by themselves. And you have a much more stable system because like the internet, if you have many local communities producing hydrogen, storing hydrogen or producing energy, storing energy, then you have a much more stable system. So if someone is missing something, you can easily trade it. And um, the system itself is much more robust. So if you have one central power plant, it's easy to destroy it, as we can see, unfortunately, now in Ukraine. And then all the electricity and energy is gone. But if you have a system spread out over the country with many small hubs, it's much more robust and the people really can control the energy and can decide how to use it, how much to use it. So that's for me is really a vision to say everyone on this world 
can build an energy community and then can control their energy and use their own energy because energy is one basic resource you really need to do everything else. Yes, and eco-villages have been doing that for 40-something years, haven't they? And they really inspire the whole think local, act global. Uh, sorry, also permaculture, which comes from an Australian, is really directing in this using, looking more local, designing things more locally. So, yeah, I think that's very attractive method of design. And over to you, Joel, what are you excited about? What's your aspiration for the next five, ten years? In our field, we really want to become the market leader. We are now uh, growing uh, rapidly. We are starting with different hydrogen hubs across Europe. Two projects uh, at the moment in Germany. We are starting 20 megawatts and 50 megawatts, one in the north, one in the south. So we are filling the gaps where there will be also no pipeline. We are looking at the sweet spots. We are seeing... And also use cases for hydrogen and, of course, acceptance is growing. Also in the field of heavy-duty logistics, we see that lots of companies are already now seeing the advantages of hydrogen. It's even cheaper than running a diesel truck. That's really true. Having a hydrogen truck is cheaper. Um, so the tolls, they were increasing so much that, uh, yeah, will be huge growth in the future. And our goal is to create 300 green hydrogen hubs across Europe. And that is, of course, also connected to Marcus's idea to build more clusterization within the energy network, uh, not being uh, uh, relied on, on, a, on a grid that is connecting everybody that can be destroyed or interconnected, but really have uh, local energy communities where also a main hub where hydrogen is produced is part of that. And of course, this is bringing more resilience to our economy. This is our goal. 300 green hydrogen up across Germany the next 10 years. This is what we want to realize. And we now really have the right partners also in Switzerland, uh, building companies that will uh, do this with us. Uh, banks, uh, UBS Bank uh, will become part of that. And uh, you will see a lot from us in the next 10 years, as I can promise. More than you would expect, probably. <laughs> I'm sure we will. It sounds like you're really collaborating with many smart people, very innovative entrepreneurial types. Yeah, I mean, they're coming automatically to us. At the, of course, we have to concentrate that, that the projects are working, uh, that the engineering is good, that the, we have the right suppliers and so on. But I uh, like to showcase this lighthouse. This will uh, bring a lot of attention. We also collaborate with the star architect who is doing the design of the production plant, also completely new. Industrial production sites never look beautiful, but now we create something that even looks beautiful. And this is, of course, something that uh, will also create acceptance. And, of course, we also want to bring education. We want to have a visitor center on our production site to see the process, to see what hydrogen does to the world's economy, to what uh, the value chain is looking like, what options you have, what innovation. So this is what we do in Neumünster, close to Hamburg. And, um, yeah, you will see very soon something even in the newspaper. This is so exciting. So if, if people in Australia or around the world want to contact you, Joel or Marcus, tell us, how do they get a hold of you? What's your email address and what's your company? How to spell it out for people is I-N-F-E-N-E-R. How do they get a hold of you, Joel? So www.infener.com. This is uh, the website will be also launched. Uh, next week a complete new version please check this up and uh, my email address is j.vogel v-o-g-l at infinair.com and marcus how do people get a hold of you so for me it's a little bit easier because our website is www.ohs.energy so that's it more or less and my email address would be mo for marcus ostermeyer mo at ohs.energy well, Thank you very much Marcus and Joel for coming on the show and ex inspiring everyone I'm sure with this technology and we are sure to hear more from you very soon and we'll have you back on the show to tell us how it's going Thank you. Thank you very much This podcast was brought to you by Arcons. Arcons is leading the digital transformation of the AEC and manufacturing industries by providing best-in-class technology solutions from world-leading partners and their own in-house development software, from the Arcons B Smart portfolio for building, 
infrastructure and manufacturing. Arcons is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our Arcons Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. So like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we advance the digital journey for AEC and manufacturing around the world. You can download our podcasts at ourcons.net or from your favorite podcast platform. From Arcons Think Future, thanks for listening.